Hi everyone, and only a quick video this week as I'm on my holes, but did want to share with you a little update on the ZX81, which I cruelly killed earlier in the year through some rather harsh prodding with a soldering iron and a mishap with a vacuum desoldering pump, which inadvertently pushed hot solder through a pad and caused all sorts of mess on the other side of the board and effectively cemented a dip socket to the main board. It was a big hot mess and I hold my hands up to it being a really silly mistake. In the meantime of course I've built a completely new ZX80 and ZX81 hybrid and had a lot of fun with that, however that old Zeddy has been sitting on the shelf looking at me with its puppy dog eyes, fix me it says, fix me, alright, alright, just stop looking at me like that. Here at The Shack, we'd like to give a big thanks to the sponsor of this video, my good friends at PCBWay. They'll be helping us out with our PCB fabrication needs and offer a very professional and high quality service for extremely reasonable prices. They can even populate your PCBs for you if you're tired of waving a hot iron around. There's a link to their website in the description where you can check out all of the amazing services they offer. Now back to the show. So. Here's the culprit and you can take this as healthy advice if you've got one of these type of vacuum desoldering pumps or are thinking of getting one. These pumps work on a process where they first blow the air out of the chamber and then suck the air back in again. Press the button in and the solenoid pushes the piston down and the air out of the chamber. Let the button go and the piston pulls in, creates a vacuum and pulls the molten solder into the chamber. Inside the chamber is all the solder previously collected which you have to empty out periodically and of course gravity means that this solder is down near the hot tip when you're using the device, therefore when you push the button you can potentially blow hot molten solder out, which isn't good. Anyway, I've since taken the step of getting a better desoldering gun because once bitten twice shy so to speak, but if one of these is on your radar be careful how you use it. So anyway, after some heavy clipping of the old dip socket and some general cleaning up with solder braid, we can see that this area of the mainboard is a bit of a mess. First step is to repair anything that is visibly broken, either through reflowing the traces, adding some solder to the copper trace to rebuild it, or popping in a bit of patch wire. Once all the stuff visible to the naked eye is done, it's out with a schematic and the arduous task of continuity testing all of the traces. Doing this revealed a few more dodgy lines and some more trace work and patch wires specifically around where hole pads were missing. So now I mentioned before that I wanted to do a 32k internal RAM upgrade and it appears that there are many ways to do this, some much more complicated than others, some involving cutting traces on the mainboard which didn't appeal after I just tested and repaired them all and some that involve other components to effectively build an external RAM expansion only on the inside, but then I found this nice little seemingly relatively simple approach so thought I'd give that a go. If you're having a go at this yourself then please be aware that it's not for the faint hearted if you're not familiar with the soldering iron or shall we say getting creative with the shape of the pins on the chip. Speaking of chips, I'll be using an Alliance 62256 32k RAM chip for this, so off we go. Now the first thing I wanted to be able to do was to have as much of this as possible to be reversible, so all of the patching and trace work so far is only to the mainboard and only to get the machine back to a working state. Clearly for the memory I'll be fitting a dip socket to the board to allow simple removal or replacement of the chip if I ever want or need to, and the other thing I want to do is to ensure that I'm not cutting or changing anything and that includes this link socket here, which you do have to change if you want more than 1k of memory on the board, so I'm fitting a header and a jumper so that I have a backwards route if needed.
Next, it's bending those pins on the 32K memory chip. This is because we need to reroute some of the connections to other parts of the board. This chip is also physically bigger than the 1K chip that was fitted as standard, so some of the pinouts are different, and of course we have new pins at 1 and 2 and 27 and 28. The instructions are really clear though, so you won't have much trouble here, just be careful with the old pliers. With all of the pins routed to their new homes, it was time to have a think about output. This old Zeddy has been fitted with a replacement ULA that generates the back porch signal missing on earlier models, but I've decided to also have a go at a little composite mod PCB, as it looks like a simple enough schematic to build and should fit nicely inside the existing modulator case. It's a really simple circuit and takes around 10 minutes to build, and look, it does fit quite nicely in there. Right, let's slap a load of Captain tape around everything, a quick once over with a multimeter on the power lines to make sure we're all good, and then it's time for a power on test. Fingers crossed. Well, that was a slow initialization, which should mean we've got at least 16K in there, and we can see the screen display, so I guess that means the composite mod works too. Let's type in a little program to test the upper memory. Well, that looks good to me. There, lovely. Right, let's pop it all back together, put on some new rubber feet, and call this done. I'm sorry it's taken so long, but we'll put this little ZX81 proudly into the finished area of the shack. Well, I'm really happy with how this turned out. It's a relatively simple upgrade, especially if you haven't completely ruined your Zeddy in the first place. If you decide to have a go at this, please let us know in the comments, or if there are any other things you can think of that we can do to this little machine. Again, let us know. For the next video though, we'll be taking a novel look at this machine's bigger brother, and my first attempt at PCB design and build, inspired by PCBWay's new PCB design competition. I'm not entering the contest myself, but it's a cool little project, so look out for that. And there's a link in the description if you want to take a gander at the contest. As always, thanks for watching, and if you like the channel, please subscribe and hit the bell for notifications of new content. If you'd like to support the channel, you can become a patron, or you can simply buy us a coffee. Links to both are on the banner on the main channel page. If you'd like to donate something to the shack, please just drop us an email. Please leave your comments below, as we always love to read them, and until next time in the Retro Shack, it's goodbye from me.